I'll request everyone to keep their cameras and microphones off so that we can start the program for the day. Good evening, everyone, and a hearty welcome once again to all our participants hailing from different time zones around the world. I'm Sneha Bhokme, a member of the Geological Institute of the Department of Geology, Residency University, Kolkata, and I shall be your host for the day. I would request everyone once more to keep their cameras and microphones off throughout the lecture as it's extremely essential to maintain a smooth session. A question answer form has already been sent to all the participants via email and telegram groups along with the shared webinar link. If you are viewing us on YouTube, please check the description box to find the attached link for the question and answer form. On behalf of the Geological Institute, Presidency University, Kolkata, I would like to welcome you all to the final lecture session of Geochron. Today, we are so happy to have with us Professor Nigel Hughes, the very renowned paleobiologist who is currently a professor of geology at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, University of California, Riverside, US. Professor Hughes has also recently been at the Geological Studies Unit of the Indian, In Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, <coughs> under the Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship. His main geological interests are the early Paleozoic history of South and Southeast Asia and its implications for understanding the la later evolution of the Himalaya and the developmental paleobiology of trilobites. Walking and hiking in nature with his family when he was a child is what first sparked Professor Hughes' interest in science and ultimately in paleontology. He has worked extensively in the Himalayas and has spent a good amount of time in the Indian subcontinent. Before completing his doctorate at the University of Bristol in England, he walked and biked the streets of a small village in West Bengal, India where he stayed and studied in Shantiniketan for eight months. In Shantiniketan, he learned to play the ukulele, which he continues to do till yeah. this day. And most of us have watched him singing his trilobite song and have really enjoyed the same. His stay here also inspired him for a children's book he later wrote titled Monisha and the Stone Forest, which has also been translated in Bengali and is called Monishar Pathurir Boni which is about a young Bengali village girl who interprets the natural history of the fossils near her home, even without a formal education. I would now request our very own Professor Kollan Haldar, Professor in the Department of Geology, Presidency University, to give a bit more introduction about our speaker and to welcome him to start today's session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sneha. <clears throat> Professor Nigel Hughes was born on a hillside near Manchester, UK in 1964. He grew up in a family and school that were actually focused on the natural environment. As a child, he used to visit and walk along hilly roads that perhaps instilled in him his interest towards everything natural. He read geology as an undergraduate in Durham University. He visited the Indian subcontinent first in 1982 and uh, returned to this part of the world, particularly in India, uh, after his BSc to study at Shanti Niketan for eight months in 1985-86. He then commenced a PhD program at BS Bristol University under Professor Derek Briggs. Nigel then taught in Trinity College, Dublin, followed by postdoctoral positions at the Queensland Museum, Australia, and the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. He served for four years as the curator at the Cincinnati Museum Center before moving to a faculty position at the University of California, Riverside, where he is presently a professor of geology. His main geological interests are the early Paleozoic history of South and Southeast Asia and trilobites and their implications for understanding the later evolution of the Himalaya. He has published four monographs, over 100 referred scientific articles, 
and the children's book monishar pathorer bon he is very interested actually in geoscience outreach to rural children in the subcontinent and in southeast asia with these words i would like to request professor uh, huges to take over and deliver his lecture over to professor huges ah well namaskar mr baike uh, uh, i'm um, i i can't i can't see anybody um i hope you can hear me clearly can you can you hear me yeah yes, yeah sir. yeah yes sir yeah. Well okay good. great um so all i can see is my slides so i i um, I'm, i'm afraid i'm not able to see your um your 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 faces which is a shame um i'd like to start off by um uh sincere thanks uh, to uh, debrati and ankan for their very kind uh, amantron um to give this presentation um uh it's the second time i've spoken at college or university um but i am uh, also have the opportunity to give a special thanks to two other institutions in kolkata um that i've been associated with um in the first case for a very long time and that is the geological survey of india um i'm going to show you a picture of the first day um i saw the gsi um but for many years i have been associated with visiting um the repository division and interacting with officers of the geological survey of india and i've been treated with tremendous kindness and friendship from the gsi and i want to take this opportunity to thank um tremendously um the gsi and all my friends uh, in gsi for their uh, support over the years um more recently i've had the opportunity to spend time in another tremendous institution in kolkata and that of course is the indian statistical institute um uh, and um um i would really um uh, like to thank uh, dr shen gupta uh, and uh, um uh, others there um origit uh, and uh, um uh, shunjukta uh, and everybody at isi who um made me so welcome um during my sab uh, sabbatical stay as a full bright fellow um and of course as you may know from the introduction um i spent time earlier at chandigarh and i'll refer to that later today i want to talk in two parts the first is about the subject which the title uh, speaks of um our work in the himalaya and uh particularly are uh, using our understanding of the cambrian geological record to understand later himalayan history that's the first part and then i would like to talk a little bit more about um our geoscience educational outreach initiatives um the monisha patorebon project but also new plans that we have for um additional uh, outreach activities um i don't think there is a region of the earth that has a more favorable or more exciting or dramatic history than the phanerozoic history of the indian subcontinent there was written uh in recently a, a lovely paper by uh, shankar chatterji and colleagues um called the longest voyage Uh, about india's migration as a subcontinent from being part of gondwana land breaking up the gondwana land moving at rapid speed colliding eventually after crossing the equator with asia to form the world's highest mountain chain there can be no more dramatic geological history in any part of the planet than that of the subcontinent and it is something that residents of all six countries of the subcontinent can feel and should feel proud of because this is an exciting and uh, wonderful history that deserves to be known widely i've been very lucky in the last 30 years 
to be able to concentrate mainly in terms of my studies in India on Himalayan geology. But I've also more recently been able to work a little bit further south onto the Indian Craton and in the Indo-Gangetic Basin. I have focused and my colleagues and I have focused particularly on the Cambrian record of the Himalaya. And the reason for that is because each of these areas shown here, and I hope you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer? My arrow as I move the arrow? No, pointer is not visible. Uh, ah, okay. Can, can um, you move it a little bit? Can you move it a little I bit? Am, I yes. I, uh, yeah, I am moving it actually, but you're not. Yeah, okay. All right, no point there. Um, um, uh, the, um, each one of these areas that is lined with the box is an area from which Cambrian fossils have been recovered. And this shows how of all the areas of the Himalaya, the Cambrian has a widespread distribution in the four major lithotectonic belts of the Himalaya. And if we progress from the north, northern margin, you can see an area in blue there, that is called the Tethian Himalaya. And the northern margin of that is the suture with Tibet. And the southern margin is the South Tibet fault system. And on the south side of that are high-grade metamorphic rocks of the greater Himalaya. The Tethian Himalaya is a sedimentary rock sequence, but uh, on the other side of the South Tibet fault system is the high-grade metamorphic rock of the greater Himalaya, which is shown in the red color. On the south side of the uh, greater Himalaya is the main central thrust, and that separates these high-grade metamorphic rocks from the rocks that are shown in green of the lesser Himalaya. And the lesser Himalaya is predominantly, again, a sequence of sedimentary rocks. To the south of the uh, lesser Himalaya is the main boundary thrust separating the Lesser Himalaya from the Sub-Himalaya, shown in yellow here, and then the southernmost fault of the Himalayan origin, the Himalayan frontal thrust. And in the little picture of India in the left-hand corner, you will see an orange uh, square and um, the locality of Dulmera, which is a locality that yields Cambrian fossils that is on the Indian Craton itself. So you can see that the Cambrian is widely distributed in those sedimentary rock bearing regions of the Himalaya and also the Indian Craton. And as I'll show you later, there is also Cambrian protolith, rocks of sedimentary origin that are now metamorphic, which occur in the greater Himalaya. So all four zones have Cambrian rock plus the Indian Craton itself. Now we're going to look at a cross section going from the south, from the Indian Craton, um, on the left hand side, northwards uh, to the Tibet. And so on the left hand side, you see that orange square representing the Dulmera. Uh, region, then the yellow square representing the uh, sub-Himalaya, the lesser Himalaya in green, and uh, the greater, and then the, the Tethian Himalaya, and the faults. And if you look at the MCT, the main central thrust, and follow that fault down, you'll see that it extends and is shown there as the boundary between the Indian shield on the left and the greater Himalayan terrain. And in this model by Pete DeSells and colleagues, 
published in Science in 2000, and with a kind of update, um, uh, which Topendar was a, also a co-author um, in 2016, this is the model that is proposed. And it's important for the purposes of this talk to understand that those zones on the left, the Lesser Himalaya, the Sub-Himalaya, um, and the Indian Kraton itself, of course, are thought in this model to be part of the Indian shield, the Indian Kraton, um, and the Greater Himalaya um, and uh, Tethian Himalaya thought to be part of a separate terrain with the um, Tethian Himalaya or Tibetan Himalaya, as it's shown here, as a sedimentary cover sequence sitting on top of an older, greater Himalayan basement. That's what I mean by basement cover. So what was the evidence that DeSells and colleagues used to uh, suggest this model? This was, uh, in their paper, primarily detrital zircon grain ages. And let's just review for a moment what uh, detrital zircons are. Zircon, of course, is a mineral that cools from melts. Um, it's a very hard mineral. So when an igneous rock that contains a zircon grain is weathered, the zircon grains are released, they enter the sedimentary system, and because they are very hard, they can withstand multiple cycles of uplift and erosion and can form therefore parts of sandstones that then become eroded uh, and form new sandstones, etc. So that means that they are very durable. So if we were to go to the beach at, the, at Diga and collect sands, we would find zircons in those and we can date radioisotopically using the uranium lead method, the age of the zircons and we will likely get a big span of ranges. Now, if we take a sandstone, um, we can also remove the zircons from it and date them, and then plot a profile such as these profiles here. And let's think about the bottom one then from the Tethian Himalaya, um, a Cretaceous rock, and you can see on the scale uh, at the bottom on the left, that there is a peak at about 1.5 billion years, 500 million years uh, ago, there's a peak. Now this is a Cretaceous rock, we know this from other evidence, and the youngest grains within it are 500 million years old, 0.5, and there are grains though all the way back to 2.6 billion years in age. This is fine. What does this tell us? It tells us something about the sedimentary provenance that was entering or building that sandstone. But it also tells us one other thing that's very important. It gives us an estimate of the maximum depositional age of the sandstone. We know that this is a Cretaceous sandstone in this case, but if we didn't know the age, we would know that this sandstone had to have formed younger than 0.5 million years ago, so billion years ago, because it has grains of 0.5 billion year age within it. So it's a maximum depositional age. Now, if you look at these three profiles, you will see that the blue and the red look broadly similar, but the green one from the lesser Himalaya is clearly distinct. And it's distinct largely in the fact that it has no grains younger than about 1.6 billion. If you see on the right, it says that the depositional age of this rock is about 1.5 billion. So no surprise that there are no young grains. But nevertheless, DeSells characterizes the lesser Himalaya and the Indian Kraton as having old detrital zircons and old crustal material, whereas the Greater Himalaya and Tethian Himalaya 
are shown here to have much younger material. And so for him, a fundamental division in the Himalaya is between younger material associated with these northern parts of the, uh, of the, um, of the origin and uh, older material in the lesser Himalaya. In 2003, <coughs> uh, Paul Myro, my colleague, and I and others um, were able to uh, publish a paper in which we took samples from both the Tethian Himalayan Cambrian rocks and lesser Himalayan Cambrian rocks. And this was the result that we achieved. And the point um, that is important to note here is that the lesser Himalayan Cambrian sample has a large number of young zircons and the distribution of ages in those young zircons looks pretty similar to that which we are seeing in the Tethian Himalayan Cambrian and in fact in the greater Himalaya and Cretaceous uh, Tethian Himalayan samples. And so our view was that the reason why um, Decelles and others found this profound difference is not a fundamental difference in the geology of these two regions, one a separate terrain, but simply that the rocks had different ages. However, as I'll show you later, um, uh, Decelles and others have responded uh, to that argument, um, and uh, this is the subject uh, of the main part of the science uh, part of this, this talk. I want to now talk a little bit about how we have approached uh, the understanding of the Cambrian geology of the Himalaya that's necessary to make these kinds of um, arguments uh, comparing rocks from different lithotectonic zones and from the Kratom. Simple things, of course, the Himalaya is a zone in which tectonic activity is, of course, famous. Um, and we've used retro deformation techniques to try to overcome the effects of deformation. This is a red lichiad trilobite using such an approach. We have done field work, as I'll show you. But of course, um, we are only the um, some of the more recent people who are working on the Cambrian geology of the Himalaya, and we uh, follow many very able geologists who have come before us. This is a photograph of the GSI taken on the first day I was in India in 1982 as a young man of 18 years old, and I visited the GSI and somehow I suppose I knew that my uh, history uh, would um, be tied to GSI in some way um, following that time. Of course, it doesn't look like this today um, with the, uh, the overpass. Um, one of the important things, of course, particularly in paleontology, is to look back to the original material that was described. And in uh, 1898, Henry Hayden, who later became the uh, director general of the GSI, um, visited the Parahio Valley of Spiti and made important collections from a number of horizons. And we have done uh, a monograph on the trilobites and also on the brachiopods um, from those collections. Uh, I want to tell you, though, about this particular specimen because it's got an interesting story that reminds us of why it's important to go back and look at the original material. This specimen here is not very striking to look at. It was described as an archaeocyathid, which is a kind of Cambrian sponge. Um, but when I saw it, I was surprised not to see the skeletal material of a sponge. And my first reaction was that this was a pyrite concretion that had weathered. I didn't think it was a fossil at all. Although near the label at the top, the paper label, you might be able to see that there is a brachiopod shell um, shown there. 
But I made, with permission, uh, kindly granted by GSI, a latex um, of this and then cast that. And when uh, shown in favorable lighting, you can now see some details uh, and particularly the fact that there are regular, you can see with the arrow pointing there, regular ribs in this structure that radiate in towards a center in towards the, the lower part of the, the photograph on the left-hand side. Um, and there's a regularity to these that you see um, uh, shown on the right that uh, made me think again about whether this was an inorganic structure. You can also see, I think, in addition to the brachiopod uh, shown on the left, that there are some tubular structures down towards the bottom. And uh, as I read literature, I realized that this was a fossil of an Eldoniid, which if you have read about the Burgess Shale or the Chenjiang fauna of China, the soft-bodied Cambrian faunas, you may know these disc-shaped fossils called Eldoniids, which have this radiating structure from the center to produce the ribs, just as we've seen. And in addition to that, these Eldoniids are often colonized by brachiopods. And when they die, their uh, bodies settle on the seafloor and are invaded by scavengers. And you can see here the same tubular burrows in this Chinese specimen, as we are seeing in the lower left-hand corner of this specimen here. So this is the first case of a soft-bodied uh, preservation, uh, like in the Burgess Shale, reported from the Cambrian of the, the Himalaya. Um, so that's just a, a little example of why it's important to revisit collections that were made a long time ago and how important it is to store these collections well and carefully. But, of course, it's exciting to do one's own field work. Um, we thought we were brave doing this. This is uh, S.K. Parcher um, from the Wadiya Institute crossing the Parahia River by coat hanger. And um, we thought this was rather daring. Um, until we saw what happened to the poor uh, donkey um, that uh, was coming along. Um, uh, so quite an adventure, um, but what a wonderful place to be as a geologist, um, because the exposure in this area is absolutely um, superb. The darker rocks towards the bottom with the uh, orange bands in uh, Cambrian, you can see a clear purple band there, that's the Cheyenne, which is Ordovician. Um, and at the top of the figure, you can see the white, famous white Muth quartzite with a thrust um, that's occurring there. And our work is classical. We climb um, up the, um, uh, the sides of the uh, sections, uh, logging and collecting, now looking across at the, the Muth quartzite. Um, collecting fossils. Um, I should say that I am not smoking a biri um, here. Um, this is a, a pencil that is in my uh, mouth, um, but uh, collecting fossils at the various horizons um, and bringing them back for processing. And uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so, we have been able to do quite extensive work, and the introduction kindly mentioned that. Um, three uh, extensive monographs, um, one on the collections in the GSI, the others on trilobites and brachiopods that are newly um, collected. We have worked not only on trilobites, but also on small shelly fossils. Um, here, a chancelloriad on the left, named in honor of um, our dear friend Diraj Manaji. Um, uh, on the right, um, brachiopods of various kinds. Um, one of the great privileges of 
working as a paleontologist is being able to name fossils after um, people that we admire. Um, this is um, Shamli Kostigir, who was a dear friend from Shantaniketan. Um, and uh, it is primarily trilobites that we have used uh, for our biozonation because they are abundant and they have many characters that allow us to designate different uh, species. There are now about 97 or 100 uh, species recognized from Cambrian rocks of the subcontinent. Um, 34 or so of these are known from other regions and so allow us to correlate with regions belong the Himalaya and uh, about 20 or so of those are new in, in our studies. And we have been able to establish and using, of course, much work that was done before, as well as our own work, um, a biostratigraphy for the Cambrian of, of the Indian subcontinent. And I don't want to go into this in a lot of detail, but I do want to mention a couple of things. Um, if you have uh, ever had the chance to study the paleogeography of the Cambrian world, you might know that there are two major faunal provinces, as they're called, um, two major biogeographic regions. One is North America with the Olenelloid trilobites, and the other is Gondwana with the Redlichiid trilobites, named after uh, a genus that was first described from the salt range of Pakistan. So that name all over the, used all over the world um, to recognize that particular formal province. Um, at the top of this slide um, is Erectocephalus indicus. This is now the first occurrence of Erectocephalus indicus is now the official designation of the uh, third series of the Cambrian, the Mialingian um, and uh, uh, Wuliun stage, um, recently designated in China. But fossils from India having a prominent international role then in stratigraphy. The next slide is a horrible slide that um, shows uh, small writing that you will not be able to read and are not meant to. It is just for me to remind um, myself to say a little bit about the distribution of um, time in the Cambrian rocks of India and that it is possible for us now to have pretty secure correlations between India and the rest of the world. So the only thing I want you to see on this slide is at the left hand side, the first column is the Himalayan zonation. But the important point is that if you look on the left hand side, you can see that from stage four up to Guzhangian in the column mark stages, there is a good representation in the Indian record. That's about 15 million years worth of time, has very good representation with Cambrian rocks on the Indian subcontinent. But 15 million years is only a small portion of the Cambrian. And the lower part of the Cambrian, extending down to 541 now million years, is represented in the Indian record by uh, only a few tens of meters. Whereas this later part is represented by over a thousand meters. So we have a very condensed record of the early Cambrian in the Indian subcontinent. This is similar to the situation in South China. But it's important when we um, come back to think of the broader implications for uplift and erosion. In particular, that very early Cambrian record is represented in the Lesser Himalaya by the Tal formation and by the phosphatic deposits that Viraj and others have worked on so extensively and that also occur in Nabatabad in Pakistan. 
Now I want to bring us back to the question of the relationships between these four different lithotectonic zones and how the Cambrian might help us in understanding that relationship. Here are two stratigraphic logs of Cambrian rocks in Janskar and in Spiti. Um, the picture is the section in Spiti, and you can see from the blue square in the column that um, this is occurring at a dated uh, zone in the Cambrian, and that if you look in the picture, um, the blue square is at the top of a succession of dark colored rocks. These are predominantly sandstones and shales. They bear fossils, so we know their depositional age, but the sandstones also contain detrital zircons. And above this, as you see in the picture, there is a striking layer of orange rock, um, which is called the Tidzi member of the Karsha Formation. It's about 200 meters thick, and it's very striking. You can go on Google Earth and trace the Tidzi member widely along the Himalayan margin. Please remember this succession, thick succession of uh, siliciclastic sandstones and shales, and then a 200 meter thick dolomite. I'm sure that many of you recognize um, this uh, mountain. This is Sagamata, Tumuluma, also known as Everest, um, and taken from the north side. And the summit pyramid of Everest is made of a gray limestone. But as you go down from the summit, you might be able to see there that there is a layer that has an orangey yellow look. It is 200 meters thick and it is known as the yellow band. And below that is a very thick succession that's called the Everest series. Now the yellow band and the Everest series are strongly metamorphically deformed. They are part of the red zone. So here is the um, uh, a close up of that. And you can see the yellow band there is this carbonate. You can see the summit of Everest with the Ordovician limestones. Um, <clears throat> and you can see the site, the level, I should say, at which we sampled. Now, luckily, um, uh, the rocks on Everest dip at 40 degrees to the north. So what is occurring at 27,000 feet on Everest is occurring at 18,000 feet, some 15 kilometers north of Everest. So we have climbed Everest geologically, um, Sagamatha geologically, but not really um, climbed. But we have done so in order to get a sample um, of sandstones from this position just below that 200 meter thick yellow band. Now, let's think about what de Sel's model was. The idea that de Sel's suggested is that the red zone rocks are a basement and the blue zone Tethian Himalaya rocks are a cover sequence that is deposited on top of that basement. So therefore, we should expect that the youngest zircons in the Tethian Himalaya would be younger than those in the red zone, if this were in fact the case. So let us look at the detrital zircon profiles. No chance of fossils in these red zone greater Himalayan rocks, of course, but what about the zircons which do survive? Let's look at them. Well, these profiles are extremely similar. And the age of the youngest peak is similar in both of these. So there is no reason to suggest that the blue zone rocks are younger than the red zone rocks. They could be younger, 
but there is no evidence to suggest that they are young. And in fact, with the similar lithostratigraphic sequence that we see in both regions, we would argue that what is being seen here is that rocks which are not metamorphosed in the western part of the Himalaya are below the South detachment system in the eastern part of the Himalaya. And that fault simply cuts up section as you go further to the east. <clears throat> so we would say that these rocks are very likely to be the same. It's just that in the eastern part, those got metamorphosed, whereas in the western part, they were not. So this is a reason why we do not agree with the basement cover uh, interpretation from the cells. Now we need to consider this issue of whether the lesser Himalaya and the Indian Kraton has a fundamentally different signature than the um, Greater Himalaya and Tethian Himalaya together. I've already shown you um, the profiles from the Cambrian rocks <coughs> of the Lesser Himalaya, so I'm not going to uh, focus on that, but just show that we do have nice trilobites that give us good ages on that. Um, but I'd like to now spend a moment talking about the Salt Range of Pakistan and also um, Dulmera, because the Salt Range of Pakistan was the first place uh, on the subcontinent from which Cambrian rocks were recovered and identified. And I thank our colleague um, in um, uh, uh, Lahore, um, Shahid Gaji, um, for um, collaborating with us on the, the, the obtaining the samples necessary for this uh, work in the, in the salt range. Um, uh, the salt range uh, has good fossils that are in the GSI collections, so I've been able to study these. And um, this interval that bears a particular trilobite, Redlichia nertlingi, is one that is correlatable to the zone level in the Tethian Himalaya, the blue zone, in the Lesser Himalaya, both in the, the um, Kral Tal belt of India and in Abbottabad in um, Pakistan, and in the Salt Range. And although the um, Cambrian rocks that occur on the Indian Kraton itself in the Nagawa region near Bikaner are not absolutely dated because they contain trace fossils but not distinctive body fossils, we still, from those trace fossils, have reason to believe that they are similar age. So using our paleontology again, we can compare rocks of similar depositional ages for the detrital zircons that they contain. So here are shown at the top logs of the sections. Of course, as is not surprising, the proximal, the onshore, deposits, um, which are further to the south, um, are, short, uh, are uh, not such thick sections. Uh, and as we go towards the north, the sections thicken up, as we would expect on a passive margin. Um, but And we see fasces changes, which are consistent with a northern deepening margin. But when we look at the detrital zircon signatures that we see, we see that all these Cambrian rocks contain zircon, detrital zircon grains that show large populations in Cambrian age and in Neoproterozoic age. There is no suggestion that um, these are rocks that are deposited on the Indian Kraton and are characterized only by old detrital zircons as in the DeSales model. De Sells' response to our initial paper, which we showed Cambrian rocks in the Lesser Himalaya, was to argue that those Cambrian rocks, part of the outer Lesser Himalaya, were actually parts of the greater Himalayan and Tethian Himalayan 
separate terrain that had been thrust south and sneaked into or onto the Indian Kraton due to thrusting. And of course, it is true that the Himalaya is full of thrusts and that the outer uh, lesser Himalaya uh, zone has been thrust over the more northernwood inner lesser Himalayan zone, which is characterized by very old rocks. So that is a reasonable argument to make. But the point is that when we look at in the um, sub-Himalaya, or when we look on the Indian Kraton itself, we find the same young zircons. There is no way that this material in uh, the Mawa was in, in placed um, by tectonically from something coming from a microcontinent to the north. <clears throat> this was clearly deposited on the Indian Kraton and it contains the young portions of zircons. So this idea that the lesser Himalaya, the true lesser Himalaya, is characterized only by old crustal material is wrong. Um, it is true that the uh, inner lesser Himalaya has very old rock, much older than rock exposed in the greater Antepian Himalaya, but that is not the only characteristic of lesser Himalayan successions. And so <clears throat> here is our um, reconstruction then of the structure of the North Indian margin. I'm sorry, without my pointer, um, please go to the um, third, please look at the third uh, illustration there um, from the top. Um, this is a reconstruction of what we think the margin would have looked like <clears throat> prior to um, the uh, uh, deposition of the Ordovician um, from the south from the Kraton side northwards uh, towards the uh, Sanko. And what we see is extensive carbonates of the Kroll um, at the top of this succession. Um, then we see the end of the carbonate platform. We don't see extensive carbonates in the Greater Himalaya or in the Tethian Himalaya. And I will draw your attention to at the top of that carbonate, you can see that at the edge there is a black line, and that is representing the phosphatic deposits of the Tal group, which are um, known and, of course, <clears throat> uh, have been mined at, 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 at times. Um, and they are occurring right on the platform margin. The, um, the figure immediately above that, the second from the top, represents the situation today, because in many regions, in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, for example, we don't see a late Neo-Proterozoic and Cambrian succession. If we drill down in cores into the Indo-Gangetic Plain, we get immediately um, uh, beneath the more recent cover down into the Upper Vindian Madhubani group, um, which is uh, uh, early Neoproterozoic in, uh, in age. So certainly um, any material uh, that was of Cambrian age has been removed from that area by subsequent erosion. The last, uh, the fourth figure there has the traces of the uh, main Himalayan faults as they are today superimposed upon this reconstruction. But our argument is that the third figure was the situation in the Cambrian part of the Ordovician uh, deposition uh, um, uh, above a nonconformity, and um, above that is the, the, the representation of the situation of what remains in the Himalaya today. Now, for the ups and downs um, part of this, um, uh, of course, our interest in the Himalaya is for it as an active tectonic belt. Um, and we're interested in how the uh, uplift history of the Himalaya correlates with major global changes in seawater chemistry and climate, all those kinds of exciting things. And because the Himalaya is a major mountain system at low latitudes um, and is being strongly interacting with the monsoon, the erosion of the Himalaya 
has an enormous effect on global seawater chemistry. And if you look at the record, the global record of osmium ratios, radiogenic osmium ratios to non-radiogenic and of strontium, what you see globally is that there is a marked change in the ratios at 16 million years. So you can see that red vertical line and it's separating a period of stable osmium isotopes before a sharp increase of that ratio, which then persists subsequent to that. Similarly, with the strontium ratios of 87 to 86, we see a steep um, a change, increase in radiogenic strontium, and then a slight decrease in that ratio at 16 million years. What happened globally or re locally at 16 million years? It's generally argued that a change in silicate weathering is responsible for this associated with global climate change. But the reasoning for that is because it has not been detected that in the Himalaya, a major change in the origin structure took place at 16 million years that would be able to explain this transition. See, the thing is the Himalaya is such a big mountain range and it's weathering rapidly, um, it can be a local source that has global effects. But we're not seeing a signal that's important at 16 million years. Why is that the case? Because if we look at the cooling record of old rocks that have been buried deep within the earth and then are uplifted using thermochronometry, we see that the rocks of the Lesser Himalaya, the inner Lesser Himalaya, those very old rocks that are mesoproterozoic or older in age, their cooling history shows that their uplift occurred at 11 million years ago. And on this chart, if we were to look at 11 million years, nothing happens. So the initiation of movement on the main boundary thrust um, and the uplift of this inner lesser Himalaya at 11 million years doesn't seem to have an effect on um, the global ratios of osmium and, and, uh, and strontium. However, in our view, that very old Mesozoic rock in the lesser Himalaya was covered by a much younger succession of Neoproterozoic and Cambrian rock. And when movement switched from the main central thrust to the main boundary thrust, or um, other thrusts in the uh, south of the MCT, the Tons thrust, for example, um, that movement uh, and uplift would have occurred earlier than 11 million years. And we've got to erode through that younger rock before we expose the mesoproterozoic rock with its distinctive age signature, its distinctive old age signature. So if that's right, we would predict that those little pockets of younger lesser Himalayan rock, the outer lesser Himalaya, would be uplifted earlier. And what age might we think that the Cambrian would be uplifted? Well, what's special about the Cambrian of the Lesser Himalaya? It has the tile formation, and it is full of radiogenic osmium. And when we do the thermochronometry of these rocks, we found that, yes, the older uh, mesoproterozoic rocks and older rocks are uplifted at around um, uh, 12 to 8 million years. But the outer lesser Himalayan rocks, the Neoproterozoic and Cambrian rocks, the Tal formation is uplifted at 16. And this, when you model the volume of 
um, Cambrian Tal that would have extended across the Himalayan origin and modeled the volume of that, it is sufficient to explain the onset of that rise in radiogenic osmium at 16 million years. The reason why geologists, very capable and very able and talented geologists like DeSales do not, uh, were not aware of this is because they're being a Bideshi geologist, you come, you come for two weeks and three weeks and you do that field work in a particular place, in his case in Nepal, where there is no outer lesser Himalaya. But a detailed knowledge of the geology of the Cambrian margin, what is left today, but what would have been there and must have been eroded earlier, allows us to detect and model and suggest when it was eroded and the consequences of that erosion for the global geochemical budget. And so this is something I really want to stress to many of you who are beginning your careers as geologists in India, that a very detailed stratigraphic knowledge or a very detailed knowledge of the metamorphic geology or, or igneous geology of the Himalaya, getting to know what is, um, what is preserved and what would have been in places and has since been removed is a vital tool, um, a vital information that you can have that is um, uh, unique and, and gives a special perspective that um, allows the testing of elegant models um, such as we've addressed here. So in our view, um, there is no reason to say um, that the Indian margin consisted of a, a, a a terrain in the northern margin. In fact, all these areas are part of a continuously deepening margin um, towards the, the north. So that's the geological um, part, the research part uh, of my presentation. I'd now like to take a few moments, though, to talk about um, the wonderful experience that I've had and I'm having um, with our work in geoscience outreach in India. Now, we've already mentioned kindly in the introduction um, the book that we did some years ago, uh, Monisha Pathorebon, which was done with friends in Shantiniketan, Rati Bashu and uh, Polak Dotto, um, and my good friend here, um, Dipen Bhattacharjo um, uh, from Bangladesh, did the, the uh, Onabad. Um, uh, this was what we call a place based. Uh, educational story um, concerning uh, a structure that's common but strange, Udwut uh, material, um, Gachpato, um, well named wood stone, um, because of course that's exactly what it is. It looks like a log of wood but made of stone. And people recognize this, of course, as strange material, um, but it's very well known. Here are village kids in Bibum, um, and they can take you straight to the place where the Gachpator is, um, is um, exposed. People recognize the Gachpator as something special. Here is Gosha Chadokan in Shantiniketan, um, and uh, uh, the piece of Gachpator is being used as a, a takur there with these beautiful flowers, because there is something special um, uh, about this material. And each of the major traditions in the area, the Adivasi tradition, the Mushulman, uh, and the, the Hindu traditions all have their own explanations for how this strange Gachpator came to um, exist. Uh, but in the story, uh, a village girl, Monisha, uh, is uh, curious. Um, she uh, wants to find a natural explanation for this amazing substance. And she has a series of uh, adventures uh, in which she learns some geological principles. She goes with her Takuma to the, um, uh, to the hot springs at Bokrasha. She gets a splinter in her finger um, uh, from a post in the hot spring. She takes out the splinter and she, she feels the silicious um, uh, uh, silicification of the woody material. 
and she begins to understand how naturally a transformation from wood to stone can occur. Uh, she has a wet shari, um, she gets a fever, and in her feverous state, she returns to the myopliocene boundary taken by Agomphothea and meets the various animals that lived at that time. Uh, she's chased by a Nimravid cat, um, and she returns, uh, the fever breaks, and she is able to tell the story of what India's past was like when the Gachapatur were living. So this is what we call a place-based educational story. We're using um, the resources of a particular area with material that's familiar to the people living in that area. And Dipen and I and our friend Bipu Tarandash um, are shown here doing presentations. Uh, this is in um, uh, uh, Suchana, which is a small um, outreach to uh, educational outreach to Adivasi children. Um, uh, I took two students of Bengali origin, uh, Taini and Snigda, um, uh, from this university, uh, University of California Riverside, to do programs. Uh, Taini is Hindu, uh, Snigda is uh, uh, Muslim, so that was uh, nice. Um, and uh, we did uh, presentations comparing here the Gonfathir with modern elef elephants. And children love, of course, to uh, see materials and hear stories about this, this, uh, uh, this strange material. Uh, and we were delighted um, when a local theater company uh, decided to dramatize the story and uh, toured quite widely in Bengal um, doing a, a dramatic version. Um, we learned some things from Monisha Patorebon. Uh, here is my good friend, uh, Shumu uh, Chakraborty, Shumuda, uh, and uh, another good friend, Payal Ghosh. Um, who uh, spent time in Shantaniketan following up on the impact of Monisha on the children who had read it a year later. And um, although we were quite pleased with the uh, results um, in terms of what the children understood, it is clear that transmitting geological information by language when literacy is around 70% anyway, is a challenge for rural Gariblo. Um, and even though a child may be able to read, struggling with some of the concepts through words, through written words, is, is, is challenging. Um, and so we need to think of ways of communicating India's fabulous geological history to children in ways that um, overcome this burden or this hurdle um, related to uh, literacy and the ability to read. Because after all, geology is an incredibly visual subject. And I became a geologist because at age of nine, I watched a television program in a friend's house about how continents move and collide with one another. It was just being discovered at that time in the early 70s. Um, and I was astonished to see this beautiful animations of probably India's movement colliding with Asia to form the Himalaya. And this is something we can tell visually without having to use words because it is a concept that is, is, is something that is real that we can relate to, to things that we know around us. So um, through friends in Shantaniketan, I've um, had the great pleasure of uh, becoming acquainted with a remarkable person, several remarkable people, um, but with Shekhar uh, Mukherjee, who is the director of the National Institute of Design in Bijawara. Um, uh, some of you may remember Shekhar from his uh, cartoons in Ananda Bajar Potrika, um, uh, and, uh, but he's the director at NID, uh, and for many years he has run every two years a fantastic uh, animation and now design festival um, uh, called Chitrakata. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to attend uh, Chitrakata on two occasions um, and see the extraordinary talent um, of animation that is present in India. And it's, it's overwhelming. I'm moved by it even as I, even as I speak. It's just amazing the, the, the quality of the work that's being done. And um, 
Uh, and through our last um, uh, Chitrakota, I met another very extraordinary person, uh, and this is Trisha Banerjee. Uh, Trisha has a master's in microbiology. She's a trained scientist, um, but she also is developing her own um, animation uh, business uh, and has um, Drishtikon Art House. And so we've decided um, to uh, try and tell a broader story of India's geological past using the medium of animation. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about that, where I should say that students at NID are involved with this too. So Manshi and very, uh, several other students are, are involved. So um, this is a, a, a broad group of people who are uh, working on this. Um, and our story, um, the English name for the, the story um, is uh, The Ocean on Top of Our Mountain. Um, we have talked in, earlier today about the Ordovician limestone on the top of Sagamatha. And that Ordovician limestone contains trilobites. And the lead character of our story is a trilobite called Gutashuti because uh, she is enrolled up in the ball, um, living in the warm, shallow uh, seas on the Ordovician seafloor prior to the breakup of Gondwana. And in the story, um, she meets Gutushuti. Well, Gutushuti is collected from the top of Sagamatha by Captain Shipra Majumda, who you may know was the first um, uh, woman from the Indian subcontinent to climb Sagamatha, um, and given to a, a village girl. Uh, we've had Monisha, so this girl is called Nutrat. Uh, and uh, Gutushuti comes back to life uh, and uh, tells and takes uh, Nushrat on an uh, adventure, uh, the adventure, the epic adventure of India's journey, 9,000 kilometers um, from the southern continents, moving at up to 20 centimeters a year past those hot spots with the Deccan and the Kogulian uh, eruptions for the dramatic uh, collision with Asia uh, to form the world's highest mountains. And of course, during that journey, also uh, a host of uh, animals and plants that were riding on the back of India, either as fossils already or living on India during that migration. So at the moment, we, what we're planning is a 12 part animated series. Um, we are building the teaser as it's called or sizzle reel as it's called here in America. Um, to uh, try and attract funding for this. Um, we're involved with character design. This has been a very exciting for me. I've never known anything about vertebrate paleontology. Um, we want to have one of the um, uh, intervals of time that we concentrate on the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Um, so here is our ISI Saurus. Um, these are the reconstructions that you see on the, um, on the um, uh, on the web if you just download things. And uh, here's an attempt that Trisha made, but we've, we've been um, involved in reading the literature and uh, Shoshwati Dee's work, um, uh, and uh, also talking with uh, Jeff Wilson. Um, and uh, you know, we're slowly um, doing our character design and trying to get um, scientifically the most accurate kinds of reconstructions um, that we can to tell these, these stories. We also, of course, want to talk about the astonishing history of the evolution of whales, which took place in the subcontinent from 48 million years to, to 40 million years. Uh, here's one of the, the later part of that series, uh, Dorudon. Um, now, if anybody is a whale expert watching, um, they'll know the dentition here needs some work and the neck is a little bit too long, but we're trying to um, uh, hone these characters to be as scientifically accurate uh, as possible. We've got to think about how to tell the story and the medium in which we want, want to, to tell it, the background. Um, and we're very um, sensitive about this because um, I've spent quite a lot of time in museums in China and I, I've seen animations and I've seen um, dioramas, recreations, and to me they always look a little bit uh, Disney. Um, and um, what we're interested in here is that India has an extraordinary history of storytelling. 
and, and graphically storytelling. So we want to uh, produce a way of, of, of presenting these images that reflects um, India's history of storytelling. And we've various devices to, to, uh, to do that. Um, we are um, uh, quite advanced now with the production of the, the, the teaser. Um, we've got to, of course, decide what we can put in that. Um, but I thought I would just show you just a few of Tricia's astonishing and her group's uh, astonishing um, uh, restorations. This is, this is without a doubt the best animation, the most biologically accurate um, restoration of a trilobite um, that has, uh, has yet been made. Um, so this is good to shoot the um, enrolling, un unenrolling um, on, on meeting uh, Nushrat for the first time. Um, uh, we're talking about style and talking about how to um, present this, um, we want to try and use uh, Bimbetka figures to, to, to some extent and certainly colorings. Um, so if you are an expert on dinosaurs, uh, you will notice that these dinosaurs are a little bit more like Tyrannosaurus rex um, than the Abelosaurid dinosaurs to which Rajasaurus, the great Rajasaurus of uh, India belongs. But we'll, we'll work on that. Um, uh, but I want to just show you a clip. Um, and I think this is the kind, this um, color motif and, 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 and design is the kind of way in which we'll uh, present, the, uh, present this, uh, this, this story. Um, and uh, 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 just finally, um, to remind everybody that um, this story of India's movement is the world's most dramatic geological story. It's something that um, is shared by every citizen of the six countries that make up the Indian subcontinent. It is dramatic. It is heroic, it is what the earth itself says, and it belongs to everyone equally. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you for this am amazing session. And that was quite some enriching knowledge. And uh, so we have received some questions which are in the process of being compiled. Once okay. done, I think you'll uh, like to address them. Oh, I, happily, yes. In the meanwhile, I will take this moment's opportunity to remind our participants that a feedback form will be sent to all of them via mail and also on our Telegram channel within the next week. I will request you all to fill up the form so that we might assess our endeavors and the response of our audience. Also, the e-certificates will be sent only to the registered participants via mail. It might take a few weeks for our participants to receive their certificates. We have been overwhelmed by the response we have received so far and we expect your further support and patience. Having said that, we can now start with our question and answer session. So shall we? Yeah, so. Yes, please. Uh, so the first question is from Bishal Shah, PG2 of President's University. Uh, he asked that he asks that there were trilobites in the Paleozoic, whereas the Himalayas was formed in the Cenozoic. Between this yes. period, there were great tectonic events. Could you please explain, despite of all these events, how did the fossils of trilobites in the Himalayas so intact and well preserved? Uh -huh. Yes, thank you for that excellent question. Um, so, um, yes, it, 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 indeed, it is a remarkable and wonderful thing that um, any sedimentary rock um, is really uh, preserved um, given the history that the Himalaya has experienced. Um, uh, the Himalayan uh, origin, of course, um, has, uh, has been studied in, in detail as to um, uh, its, its structural geology. 
Um, and one of the discoveries, of course, of recent years is, um, is a clearer understanding of the dynamics of what has gone on as India has uh, plowed northwards into Asia. Um, and uh, we mentioned a series of faults that occur, the South Tibet fault system, the main central thrust, the main boundary thrust. The basic story is that as India has moved northwards, so the material piles up and gets thicker and thicker, and eventually the thrust system breaks to the south. That's why the South Tibet detachment system is the first fault, and then the main central thrust, and then the main boundary thrust, and Himalayan frontal thrust. So um, there's a series of steps uh, and uh, changes in the location of movement. Now, the striking thing about the Himalaya is that the um, metamorphism, the high degrees of metamorphism, of course, locally they're occurring in many regions, um, but um, the strongest degree of metamorphism is in this um, greater Himalaya, um, the northern boundary of which is the South Tibet detachment system and the southern boundary of which is the main central thrust. Um, and there's been a lot of interest recently um, over the last 15, 20 years um, uh, about what's called the channel flow idea, um, which is that, that, that a lot of the strain accumulation that has taken, um, had to be taken up as India has moved northwards has been accommodated in that particular zone and in association with, um, with melting that's occurring in that, uh, in that region. Um, so um, as the, this sort of scraping up uh, occurs as India plows northwards, there are some areas um, of rock that become deeply involved um, in, in this and very strongly metamorphosed. But there are others that are kind of scraped upwards. They do have deformation. We've used the retro deformation, but they have survived relatively well intact. And, um, and, and so that is how um, certain portions of the Himalaya, which are away from the, 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 the faults themselves, um, and are not part of this area where um, the, the maximum um, strain is being accommodated, are preserved relatively well. And of course, in, in Pakistan, in the salt range, um, the, you know, the, the collision of India, the, 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 the greatest deformation is in the central part of, of the origin. Around the edges, um, you see um, uh, better preservation of the original stratigraphy. That's why, for example, the Cambrian is preserved in the salt range of Pakistan, because it's, it's away from the place of, of most direct impact. And this is kind of an irony. Um, um, for a structural geologist or metamorphic geologist, they want to go to the place where deformation is most strong, because that's where you see this, these structures and you see deeply into the origin. But if you want to reconstruct what the margin was like before collision, you want to go to those places where deformation is least, because that's where the original structure of the margin will be best preserved. So that's the kinds of rocks that uh, uh, we as, as stratigraphers and sedimentologists focus on. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for answering that question. Uh, so we move on to our next question, which is from Mr. Arindam Bhattacharya, research scholar, University of Zeged, Hungary. How oh. does chemical associations change for zircon as we move through various stages of uplift of the Himalayas from the Tethyan basement to the Indian Shield? Um. I, sorry, the line was a little um, a uh, or, Okay, sir. I, I'll repeat that. Um, yes, I'll repeat yeah. that. Uh, so, Arin, Mr. Arindam Bhattacharya asks, mm, how yeah. does chemical associations change for zircon as we move through various stages of uplift of the Himalayas from the Tethyan basement to the Indian Shield? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, um, 
uh, so detrital zircon grains, um, uh, obviously, zircon is an igneous mineral. I mean, it forms from the cooling of melt. Um, there are um, various changes that can occur, and uh, often zircons have um, rings uh, of different ages because overgrowths can occur. So when one is doing this kind of work um, in dating the zircons, this, this is not something that I do myself, colleagues of mine have done, but they have to be careful to try and make sure that um, they get the center of the grain and that they can, can be convinced that this is the original um, age of the formation of the, uh, of the, of the zircon. Um, uh, so the, um, uh, so uh, the, the, um, the provided that one uh, is actually dating the original depositional age of the zircon, um, it will tell us something about the provenance of material. It tells us that um, you know, a grain that formed at that time uh, was incorporated into this particular sandstone. And by doing that with multiple grains, we get some idea of the provenance because, um, of course, some areas of the world will be eroding rocks of a particular age that uh, have a rich in zircons of that age, um, and then that peak will be characteristic of um, uh, a source from that particular area. A peak in the detrital record will indicate, ah yes, this sediment was receiving, this um, sandstone when it was forming was receiving sediment from this particular source. So we can, we can use these detrital zircon records um, partly in paleogeography um, uh, and for showing distinctions between different regions. Um, and also it can give us some uh, constraint on the maximum depositional age. Um, uh, the, the extent to which subtle differences in distributions um, are meaningful and the um, statistical approaches for uh, for uh, designating whether a difference is significant or not. Um, these are areas that still are, are subjects of active debate. Okay, so that that answers, okay, so so we move on to our next question, which is also from Mr. Rindam Bhattacharya. How yes. do orientations and depositional conditions change for the trilobites from the basement of the greater Himalayas to the lesser Himalayas? Oh, how does it? Yes, that's an interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, so, um, uh, uh, I think the 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 answer um, uh, is that we we do see a, a fascist change um, from um, the near shore environments. Um, uh, obviously, the Salt Range, for example, um, is famous uh, for its uh, evaporite deposits. That's mainly neo Proterozoic, but there are uh, evaporitic deposits in the Cambrian red beds in the in the salt range, and same in the Nagar group. Um, as we go further northwards, we go uh, across um, the edge of the carbonate platform, as I as I mentioned, the Kroll carbonate platform, and then into a deeper water succession uh, to the north of that. We see um, marker beds that are found throughout the region, like the the Blaney. Um, the famous um, diamictite, uh, Precambrian diamictite, occurs um, in the Lesser Himalaya um, and uh, uh, and also the Mangia um, in the Tethian Himalaya um, represents the the, the, the same um, event. So we can correlate um, not just using fossils, but also using lithological uh, markers um, from the the, the proximal uh, near shore cratonic side into the, the, the deeper water margins. And we did certainly see a, a big increase in the thickness of uh, Cambrian sediments as we, as we go to more, uh, more distal settings and a change in the um, uh, sedimentary regime. But one thing that is worth mentioning um, is that uh, I mentioned how the uh, distribution of Cambrian time in the Himalaya is very uneven. So there is a period between about 
515 and 500 million years ago that has a very thick um, succession uh, in the uh, Tethian Himalaya. Um, there are beds which contain trilobites, but there are many beds which are probably fluvial. So even in the Tethian Himalayan region, we are not talking about deep water margin. We're talking about um, you know, the transition between a terrestrial ecosystem and, and uh, a terrestrial system and um, shallow marine, probably deltas um, prograding out and switching um, high depositional rates um, occurring at that, at that time. So never a very deep margin, but clearly there are um, proximal to distal fasces changes um, that are occurring um, uh, across the, the deepening uh, margin as we go towards the north. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, so we can move on to our next question, which is from Mohammed Anisur Hok of Presidents University. What may be the reason of difference for the detrital uh, zircon and Cambrian fossils? Um, uh, reasons for their difference? Um, uh, well, um, I would say that in general, the results of these are, are, are in accord. So um, we, we, uh, we're not terribly worried by differences between them. Um, uh, there are um, um, some differences that I, I might uh, can uh, think of immediately um, in in the Himalaya uh, and actually around the edge of Gondwana. Um, rocks that we know the depositional age of from the fossils they contain generally contain very young. So um, that means we're 520 million years. That means that young zircons are being um, incorporated, are being captured in the sandstone. And that is reflecting uh, extensive volcanic activity that was occurring around the margin of equatorial Gondwana land at that time. Um, all around the margin of equatorial Gondwana, um, there uh, is extensive granite intrusions in the Himalaya, um, and this continues into Southeast Asia. There are even volcanic, um, it's quite extensive volcanic deposits, certainly in Sibamasu in Thailand and, and uh, Myanmar uh, and in Baoshan in China, also actually in Bhutan. Um, uh, so um, I showed you an example where a Cretaceous rock had no zircons younger than about 450 million years old. That's because there was no significant activity um, producing volcanic material, producing igneous materials that were accommodated in that Cretaceous sediment in the interval between the Cretaceous, say 100 million years ago, and this event of of 500 or 450 million years ago uh, around the edge of Gondwana. So you can have, of course, a big difference between the age uh, indicated by the fossils for the deposition and the age of the youngest zircons. That's why it only tells you, the age of the youngest zircons only tells you the maximum depositional age. It doesn't tell you the depositional age or the minimum depositional age. It only says this sandstone cannot be older, cannot have formed old prior to the age of the young zircons. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have our next question from Dr. Chiran Nando De, professional employee at GSI India. What about the Vendian or Tomotian, Vendian Tomotian boundary characterization in the Himala Himalayan belt in terms of mm. edicurrent and trace fossils, lithological and environmental changeover, especially in the perspective of snowball earth theory? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Kroltal belt 
um, has a very nice uh, succession, of course, um, uh, from uh, the the uh, of that interval of the Neoproterozoic and transition into the Cambrian. Um, and I, I mentioned in discussion um, the previous but one question, the Blaney, um, which is a prominent diamectite. Um, uh, and for many years, the Blaney was mistaken for the Talhir, um, which of course is the Gondwanan uh, diamectite, um, but uh, was uh, more recently understood to be um, the representation in the Indian subcontinent. Um, um, uh, so um, there is the, you know, the Blaney um, in the in the Koltal belt, so in the Lesser Himalaya, and it also has equivalents in, in Pakistan. Um, the paper that we did last year in Geological uh, Society of America Bulletin speaks about that. Um, but uh, as I also mentioned, um, the Manjia, um, which is a um, a conglomerate that occurs in the very thick um, clastic successions in the in the Tethian Himalaya um, is also uh, a diamectite that occurs uh, and is the correlative, uh, highly likely to be the correlative uh, of the. And then in the Tal region, um, of course, we have the the infra crawl, um, and then the thick carbonates of the crawl, and then that carbonate platform is drowned um, and we go into the um, lower Cambrian and into the Tal and into that phosphogenic uh, rich uh, setting. Um, uh, of course, the Ediacaran um, occurs around that transition. Um, we described um, with um, uh, uh, respected uh, colleague, of course, uh, Owen Bhargava and others, um, the uh, Sanchi Lithis, which is a strange tubular fossil uh, from the Nagali Dha syncline um, recently um, that uh, is part of these uh, strange tubular fossils that occur around the Ediacaran um, Cambrian boundary. Um, the, uh, as I'm sure many know uh, from Nanital, um, various uh, textured organic surfaces have been described. Um, also from uh, Rajasthan uh, in the Jodhpur region, um, these kind of rippled surfaces then with organic textures are also um, known. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, there are uh, some of the more distinctive um, Ediacaran forms um, uh, have yet to be recognized in the Indian subcontinent, but certainly um, these kind of uh, very special depositional conditions and um, preservation of algal mat-like structures um, seem to be uh, consistent with what's been seen in Nandital and uh, and also in the in the Rajasthan in the Jodhpur um, region. So I think that uh, the record is comparable to that of uh, South China in broad uh, sense, um, and um, and you know hopefully um, uh, more more fossils of that interval will be um, will be found. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so we have the next question from Arunaditya Dash of PG2 IIT Roorkee. Given we are approaching the sixth mass extinction, which organisms, according to you, would be great candidates for index fossils in the study of our current conditions in the distant future? <laughs> Oh, I think um, any organism made of plastic. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not being very serious. Um, but uh, um, uh, yes, that's an interesting. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I, 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 the, 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 I recommend. That. Anybody interested in this issue from a geological perspective, there is a wonderful book published about 10 years ago um, called um, The Earth After Us. The Earth After Us. And it's by um, Jan Zalazevich. I went look for it under The Earth After Us um, because his name is Polish and it's very complicated to spell. Um, but um, I can 
pass it on to um, our organizers. Um, but uh, it's a wonderful book um, that talks about aliens coming to the Earth in 30 million years time. And they're sophisticated aliens. Obviously, they've got to be able to travel through space. So they understand scientific principles. And then they are observing the Earth as they become closer and then landing on the Earth and identifying that 30 million years prior, there was a, a civilization that existed. And it, 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 it sounds like a rather um, a fantasy kind of, of, of thing, but it's beautiful actual illustration because these, uh, these aliens understand scientific principles and they focus in on what is unique about the Earth. Um, and as they approach, they notice that the Earth is stratified. The presence of strata, the presence of a dynamic um, Earth system that is constantly resurfacing the Earth is indicating this balance of energy coming from in the interior of the Earth and from the exterior, which makes our planet such a rich and active um, place. And uh, <laughs> I suspect that the to come back to the question that the, the, the most um, clear indicator of human civilization that will exist is some kind of geochemical anomaly that's related to you know, the extraordinary um, uh, chemical cycling and, and use of metals and um, all, all these kinds of activities that we are doing that are concentrating um, particular uh, rare elements that normally are distributed throughout the the, um, the the rock record and concentrating them in this particular layer um, due to our activities. So I would guess that a geochemical signature is likely to be, you know, the the, the principal uh, the principal one. Other than that, um, you know, the normal things about being preserved. Um, you want to become a fossil. It's good to have a hard skeleton. Um, it's good to be in a place that's uh, net deposition of sediment rather than erosion of sediment. So a shallow ocean is a good place. Being on a mountaintop is not a good place. Um, so animals that live with shells in shallow marine situations have a much higher chance of being preserved um, than those that live on continents, for example. Um, so, um, But I suspect that this geochemical anomaly will be our legacy. Uh, thank you, sir. So we have Topun Chakraborty over here on MS Teams who had raised his hand. He had. Oh, gosh. Top of that. Yes. So I, are you there? A vigorous defense of, of, oh. of, of cells. Nigel. 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 Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it was a wonderful lecture of uh, Himalayan up and down as well as that of uh, your your animation stories that is uh, in the office, uh, not yet known. I just wondered that uh, your your basic idea, uh, the research idea that you call on the, can you hear, to hear me? Hello. Uh, I can hear you, yes, I can yeah. hear you, yeah. Uh, your, your basic idea that the, uh, that the uh, uh, that the difference as suggested by the cell on the three different or majority units, little stratigraphic, tectonic stratigraphic units, are not valid because of the zircons are, uh, I mean, the age of the detrital zircons collected from all these units looks very similar. Now, have we tried uh, from really different terrain, maybe? Yeah. Maybe uh, much, much different from not from Mala, from the hedonic mass of India, much younger sediment, uh, which looks quite different. Or are a large uh, age range that is depicted by all these units are probably also true for the uh, laser Himalayan succession, uh, the Shwalix. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wonder whether this, how far this logic is valid, 
because the Zakam Veds have a great range. Uh, yep. Can you use statistics in some way to pinpoint that one was the source, the dominant source of the uh, for a particular yeah. example? Otherwise, uh, otherwise, it seems uh, rather peculiar uh, to me that if, if there are many other units which have similar spread of zircon and occurrence of zircon, apparently having a similar picture, uh, I mean, they may not be related mm. to the uh, deposition in uh, the northern part of the Indian Krita that ultimately form parts of Himalaya. Yeah. Um, I, 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 the line again is a little bit unclear, uh, Tobinda, but, but, but I think I got the main, um, uh, the, the main points of this. Yeah. Um, so, so certainly, um, I think that in terms of our, our, our major um, issue uh, of this, you know, is the true Lesser Himalaya only this very old rock, um, or um, is that was there a cover sequence um, of Neoproterozoic and Cambrian rocks that extended southwards? Right. Um, uh, I think we 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 can show that that was really definitively true. Um, that that it's impossible. It's impossible that that the that the young Neoproterozoic and Cambrian was also from a um, but. Having said that, um, I think your question is about the the more subtle um, distinctions um, and the possibilities of uh, quite different detrital zircon signatures from rocks um, that you know may be in a stratigraphic succession. Um, and, uh, and 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 surely that is true that um, that uh, different sources. Um, are going to yield different detrital zircon records, um, uh, and um, and and I think that uh, my former student Ryan McKenzie um, is very interested in east to west transitions in detrital zircon signatures along the Himalayan margin, and um, uh, and is making the argument that there are quite significant. Um, changes. We are very interested in Bhutan because the Cambrian geology of Bhutan is younger than the rest of the Himalaya, um, and it is very similar to Siva Masu. Um, and um, uh, it also has volcanic uh, deposits as, as Siva Masu has. And I, you know, this is, I have no strong. Um, evidence for this, but I wonder whether the Bhutan signal is is more allied with with Sibamasu than uh, um, it's, um, in, in terms of this very. Uh, but the um, the only thing I would say with um, we've we've. Um, a um, number of times people have the um, people have said um, uh, you know this unit above that unit um, uh, it's stratigraphically younger but it only has old zircons in it uh, Nadine Macquarie has said this uh, about Bhutan but when you have all the situations in which we have an independent evidence of the day um, the the, um, there is a correspondence between the depositional age and the, um, the, the age of the youngest zircons in the, in the Himalayan system. So I'm, uh, when I'm told that there are younger rocks with, with only old zircons in them, um, uh, my experience has been that, that is, you know, there's a fault um, uh, between them. Um, thank right. you, though, for the question. I did. Uh, I should tell our, our um, I, I should tell our, our organizers that um, you did mention the ukulele, and I do 
I do have one sitting here in case you need it. Where are the organizers? I'm sorry? Well, I cannot hear anything from the organizers. Sir, can oh, yes, you please turn yes. on the sharing? You can uh, now you stop sharing your screen. Uh, okay. Am I audible now? Yes, you are audible. Okay, so I just had a network issue. Uh, so uh, I think yeah, our... can you can you stop sharing? I mean your PPT is still on the screen. Oh, yes. I, I suppose I can get rid of that. Yes. I don't know how to. I was thinking that somebody might ask questions, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, oh, ah, here we go. Yeah. OK, so, so that was a great session, sir. And thank you for answering so many of our questions with such patience. Thank you for being our speaker today and, of course, managing some time for being with us. Please right. do visit our department whenever you visit Kolkata next. And if you find some time, of course. Uh, I will certainly do so. Thank you, sir. And it's almost an end of today's session. We will now have a screenshot to preserve a memory of this day. Hello, Najala. OK. Hello. Hello. Hello, Najala. Viru is speaking. Uh, hi, hi, Baru. Hi, nice to see you. Oh, I haven't seen you, but uh, how are you, sir? Hi, I'm very well. How are you? Thank you for your oh, email. Fine. I, I haven't got. Fine. I'm so I have proud to measure. It. <laughs> no, nice to nice to see you. Yeah. Wow, it's great nice to see all these nice photos talk. of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Nigel, do you plan to have something Bengali with Guti Shuti? Yes, we plan to do um, versions in Hindi, Bengali, and English. Oh, that's, um, that's, that's great. The, that's the plan. Um, uh, we need to, um, so the plan is that we will um, make a, a, a teaser, um, and, um, and then we are going to, um, uh, to ask, um, uh, see if we can get funding to produce the, the whole series. Um, and so this this will be this will be quite soon because we're we're coming towards the the uh, the end of production of the season. Good, that's good. That's really good. Hello, Nigelda. Uh, so so Hello. Um, now uh, I will request. Okay, sorry. Uh, anyone say anything? If not, then I'll request Hi. Professor. Uh, Ghosh, our department to deliver the final word of thanks. So, please, Guru. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sneha. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. yes, sir. yes. Okay. So, someone was uh, trying to interact with Professor Hughes, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to express my uh, sincere thanks to Professor Hughes for accepting our invitation and presenting today his beautiful lecture and interacting with the students. Eventually, uh, today is the last day of our lecture series, Zeochron, uh, which was organized by the Geological Institute, the student body of the Prince uh, University. So in this uh, respect, I would wish to mention here that Geological Institute uh, was founded way back in 1905 by Professor, late Professor Hemchandra Dashukta with a vision to encourage our students to look beyond their academic curriculum and regular classwork. And following his uh, idea and footsteps, the Institute, since its inception, it regularly organizes academic discussions in various formats, and it also publishes a yearly student journal named Bhuvidha, 
where the student members are the major contributors and we publish both english uh, their uh, like their writings in english as well as in bengali uh, the success of the institute over the years have been principally achieved by the continuous support and interaction amongst the present batch of students the alumni the faculty members and our various well wishers from different institutes across the globe on behalf of uh, the institute members and the department i wish to uh, convey them my, our sincere gratitude to all of them this year has been very special since this uh, outbreak of this pandemic situation disrupting all normal gatherings and academic activities in view of this extraordinary situation we decided to pursue our academic endeavors by organizing this type of uh, online webinar series and thus this yopron was initiated uh, it started uh, on with this first lecture on 22nd august and continued till today and within this uh, month long uh, lecture series it was our privilege to hear from academicians of great scientific rep reputes from different continents all over the globe these lectures covered some of the most interesting topics of the present hour from traditional core subjects to the latest arenas of research in art science i hope that the attending students and the participants have utilized this opportunity to their fullest and i uh, sincerely wish we can carry forward this uh, legacy of this century old institute through more such online activities in future at the end i would like to thank the university authorities for giving us support at every step i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all my colleagues who offered their wholehearted support at every step whenever needed i would thank the students and all the participants without whose cooperation this endeavor would not have been successful lastly my heartfelt thanks to the student organizers of the institute who with their incessant energy and untiring efforts have made this event a great success thank you all over to you sneha hello sneha are you there Yes, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible. Okay, so thank you, sir. Thank you, professor. Thank you to Professor Ghosh for that kind vote of thanks. Also, a big thank you to all our participants on Microsoft Teams, as well as those who were with us on YouTube. With that, this we wrap up our online lecture series, Geochron. It was a great experience for us to host such a series of lectures. and hope we hope it was enriching and enjoyable for all of you so now goodbye and good night to you all